welcome back. Um, yet another in our series of Blue Glow Electronics YouTube videos. Um, this one is going to focus on a uh, model 2250B Marantz. It's a really nice unit. Uh, a friend of mine dropped it off for me to work on. I think the story goes he landed this one in a Goodwill store for a few bucks. Um, but it's a, an extremely clean unit. You can see here um, not this thing's not had a lot of dust inside of it. Um, really nice unit overall. I've already taken the cabinet off, but um, what we're going to be doing is diagnosing this thing. I thought we could just do it together. Um, I'll walk you through what I'm what I'm going to do. Um, the, the note I got from from him was basically um, really nice unit, but will not power on. So uh, we're going to go figure out what it is about this unit that is uh, that is not powering on and uh, kind of take it from there. A little tip I'll show you. I try to keep an extremely neat workbench. Um, I've got another room next door here that's more like a shop. Um, got multiple workbenches, drill press, tools, things of that nature in there. So a lot of the heavy lifting happens over there. A lot of times I'll take the cabinets off in the other room. And, um, sometimes I'll do it here, but either way, typically all I bring to the bench is a piece of equipment. Um, that, that way I don't have piles of equipment, uh, you know, kind of stacked up around the bench. I'll also, um, over here, you know, I'll make stacks of uh, the screws. So I just put all these screws in a bag called 2250. That way I'm guaranteed not to lose them. And uh, anytime I've got multiple pieces going on at once. Because a lot of times I'll, I'll be working on something that I'll have to wait on parts. And so I'll kind of push those aside. Um, sit them off on the floor over here while I work on another piece. But... I'm a uh, one piece of equipment on the bench kind of guy at a time. So let me uh, do just a little bit of diagnostics here and I'll, I'll try to show you what I'm doing as, I, as I'm going along. Okay, what I've done thus far, just so you're clear on what I've done, I've plugged the uh, power cord into a little uh, device over here, a little kilowatt. Um, see these things used a lot. And yeah, I notice my kilowatts down to 112 volts. I'm going to crank that up to about 120. I probably hit it with my foot earlier. Anyway, right. that's close enough. Um, use my little foot switch down here. Got the unit turned on. And I hit the power switch. And guess what? Nothing. No lights, no action, uh, no camera. <laughs> anyway, right. I flipped it upside down. And look what I see here. If you can get focused on this. Uh, let me kill the switch with my foot. At any rate, right here, main power leads going into the uh, power switch up in here. Uh, looks like there's been some, uh, you can see some solder clumps right there in the middle, right above that resistor. You can see there's been some, uh, some merging of some, this is plain old brown zip line, they call it. Just the old, like a um, brown light cord that you used to see. And that's feeding out um, to what would be the uh, main power lines here. So I'm going to dissect this a little bit and uh, give my buddy a ring, let him know what's, what I believe is wrong with it. And uh, we'll be uh, back and show you a little more. Let me get this tape off of here. Okay. I want to show you something here. If you notice, I've got the knob off here. I'm starting to pull the knobs off the front of this thing. And these were being fairly difficult to pull off. So I want to show you a little trick that I learned a long time ago um, on how to get knobs off of um, off of radios without scratching any surfaces anywhere, without putting big dents in your, um, in your receiver or your knobs. Because one of the things I'll tell you, if you pull really hard on these and they're stuck, you'll notice these, uh, these knobs. It's a little aluminum cover that goes on top of uh, the plastic knob and they're just glued in there with some epoxy or something from the factory but they are known for pulling off and then you have to put them back on get them straight so that the, the little ticks properly aligned here with the flat spot and you have to put a little glue in them and put them back together and let it let it glue and dry uh, just something you want to avoid if you don't want to you don't want to have to go down that road so the trick involves two spoons, um, just normal household spoons. I went upstairs and uh, grabbed these out of a junk drawer. That's some old silverware we don't use anymore. And um, what you basically do is come in here behind the thing and you put pressure from both sides at the same time. 
And if you'll notice what happened, um, pops pops right off. Didn't uh, put any uh, undue pressure on the uh, on the unit. No scratches anywhere. And off comes the unit. I'm gonna have to move this. Uh, I've got something propping this uh, camera up here. I'm gonna have to move it to finish getting this one off. It's uh, pretty close there. At any rate, um, another thing this trick's really good for. What it does is just uses the leverage of the roundness of the spoon, and it's basically a, a, a two-sided pry bar there. So you're prying from the back of the knob. Um, outward versus the edge of the knob. A lot of times, if you come along with a, uh, you know, a flat screwdriver or something like this, and you try putting it back in behind, one you're wedging it on one side, which uh, creates uneven pressure. But two, you, then you end up um, putting a dent in the side of your thing here, or a scratch in your uh, in your receiver or whatnot. Same trick works great on uh, car emblems. So. Uh, on the front of uh, you know a vehicle or whatnot, you're trying to get an emblem off that's been pushed in with little grommets. Um, that'll that'll pop that uh, that off as well as well as trim work or whatnot. Anyway, I want to show you that, and I'll be right back. I got to finish taking off um, these four screws right here, which I believe are three eighths thread. Um, I keep a little set of these gear wrenches here handy in my little basket of mini tricks and tools here. Matter of fact, let me, I'll show you what all's in this little thing. This is what I use for 90%. Got a really good set of uh, uh, snap-on pliers, a uh, little set of wire snaps, a really good high-quality set of uh, wire strippers that I use a lot, various Sixelite um, screwdrivers that I use a lot here. That's actually a lot of brand. And, um, Let's see, uh, some uh, solder uh, wick here if I needed to, just some small strip ties, a whole multitude of uh, small screwdrivers, little hex head drivers here in this spot, um, those wrenches, 3 8 half, 5 8 This is a neat little device. It is a uh, little screwdriver with a, uh, a knife with a, a uh, yeah, drill bit in the end of it. A couple more little bitty uh, small drivers. These are uh, set I bought. These are what are very commonly used uh, for phone cases. So this, I know for a fact this red one is the one that fits on a uh, iPhone uh, case. Got a set of uh, Klein crimpers here I use for crimping terminal ends on. Uh, let's see. I, I uh, use this a good little bit. It's used to uh, tell the temperature a laser temperature sensor. Um, I use that for um, measuring tube heat. Um, if you got one tube getting much hotter than another, it's likely not biased properly. These are some little foldovers. Um, you basically put a resistor or whatnot in it, and then you bend the uh, leads. Uh, you lay it in the middle, and then you bend the leads down. You end up with a perfectly straight bend over. Some really nice um, hex head uh, uh, sockets here that I've got. A set of those. Um, oh, this is a cool one. This is for wire wrap. So like on a Marantz um, unit, a lot of them on the edges of these things will have wire wrap. This is both the wire wrap and unwrap tool. Um, little uh, straight edge uh, punch. A uh, little curved edge punch. Use this all the time for putting on turntable belts. Uh, you have to reach down inside, pull the belt, uh, put it over the pulley or whatnot. And then finally here, just a cheap old solder de uh, sucker. Plain old uh, toothbrush here, a uh, screwdriver, chopstick. I've talked about that before. I use chopstick a lot of time for uh, tapping on boards and whatnot. So if you got anything loose, a whole pile of nylon uh, strips there. A really long Phillips screwdriver, and a paintbrush I use for dusting off stuff. That's what I primarily use here on the back wall. I've got a couple more pieces that I use from time to time, but I'll tell you I've serviced a gazillion things with this stuff that you've just seen. So um, I'll be uh, right back as I uh, get this front face plate off to show you a little more. All right, I thought I'd show you a little more. What I've done is I've taken out these 3 8 inch threads. There's four of them on most Marantz units. Some of the smaller units, like the 2230 or whatnot, they'll just have a screw here and here, but these will have a um, an actual 3 8 inch screw here, and we'll take these out. 
Not the hardest thing on this earth. And this one needs a little more loosening here. Put it all finish. The reason I like to use these gear wrench or any good socket, you know, they're really high quality chrome steel and um, you don't end up scratching anything with it when you uh, when you use them. So once we got that off, you would think the face plate here would just drop right off, but it won't. See this little, see out of all the holes here, you can see all the way back in there. This one has a brass knob around it that uh, I'm going to have to break loose and uh, I have to use a screwdriver to do that, but I'll be right and show you what that looks like as it comes out. Okay, what I'm going to do here is just put a screwdriver up against the shaft, you can see, and then outwards. There's probably a wrench made for this, but as you can see as I start turning it here, this thing starts to come out. And uh, what I'm going to do then once I get it going is just kind of use my fingers a little bit here to get this thing. You're getting all the Marantz trip tricks today. Um, these really are not that tough of, to work on, these units. Are, they're a little bit complicated. There's a good bit to them. You know, they got a phono section, a preamp section, uh, kind of an FM AM section, a Dolby section in some of them. Um, so not the simplest things to work on, but yet not the toughest either. Um, and they're mostly all alike. And that's the last knob. These little knobs here on the front of them rats and the power switch here. Um, you can see this faceplate will come out over those. So once you get that last knob off, here we go. We now have the faceplate of the Marantz off. And why did I do that, you might ask. Well, i got to get to this power switch in here. That is the culprit. And if you'll notice, there's two screws, one on each side, which you cannot get to without removing that. So that's why I had to get here and uh, take that thing out to be able to do this. Let me... um. Let me drop this camera, get the screws out here. Um, they use, if you notice, all around the screws is this blue stuff, right? Um, sometimes it's green, sometimes it's red. Um, they, it's like a little bottle of fingernail polish, basically, that they use in the factory. They put a dab on there, and what it does is basically like glue, and it keeps you from being able to uh, spin, the, spin the knobs. I actually use Loctite the same way. I just use a drop of it um, when I'm putting them back in. I don't, I've tried to buy this stuff and it's not a, that easy to find without buying large quantities. So, mostly I just use Loctite myself and we'll be back shortly. All right, if you'll notice, these screws are out now. And uh, just use our number two screwdriver bit here, a really good new one. Uh, I buy these in bulk of about 20 or 30. They're, uh, they're um, DeWalt brand. But anyway, what I use them in is my little handy dandy Ryobi. Um, Tech 4 um, nut driver. This thing has two speeds, uh, fast and slow, and you can adjust the torque on it. And it has a, kind of a quick on and off uh, for the ends, and then I just use um, one of these little magnetic deals here where you can pull your uh, your bit off, use a Phillips head or a flat head, whatever, drop it right back in there and you're good to go. These things are $20 if you find one of the uh, used, I mean, uh, New tool outlets. Can't beat that. Um, bought an extra battery and uh, keep a spare one charged. I'd use this thing all the time. Alright. If you notice, that was where these things were taped up. <laughs> um, I'm not going to bash anyone else's soldering work. I'll let you make your own opinions. Um, anyway, now the screws are out. This thing will just come out on its own. And... There again, some uh, some lovely globs of solder here that you'll see. They look to be cold solder joints. And uh, uh, anyway, I'm gonna remove those real quick. I'm gonna take the switch out. Um, got the meter out here, and we're gonna test them. Be right back. All right. So, what we got here? Um, if you'll notice, I've got the meter set on um, diode resistance sound capacitance check and when you've got it on the sound what that is is continuity check and if you notice when you turn it to that switch you can hit the mode button here a few times and it goes between auto goes between uh, resistance a uh, little symbol up here for a diode check um, but the one I want is this one right here if you'll notice the little symbol for the continuity check 
So what happens when you have it on continuity check? If you touch these two leads together, guess what you get? You get a beep. And let me see if I can show you real quick here. I might have to kind of try to prop the phone up here or the camera while I show you. If you notice when I touch the black and red together, beep, beep, beep. I'm going to clamp it back on the end here. So what should happen with this switch is um, when you push the button, guess what it should do? Beep. There is no beep. That was me making that noise. Um, so we got, we've got dead switch. Now, one of the tricks I've learned over time with uh, Morant's gear is sometimes one side of the switch, if you'll notice this is a dual post, um, single throw, if I've got that right. Um, so got two sets of posts here, and uh, really there's two switches inside of this one switch. So I'm going to move these wires over to the other side of the switch real quick, and I'll probably have to drop the camera to do so. But I'm going to see if the other side of the switch is good. Um, I have seen these where one side's bad, I move the wires to the other side, unit works great, keeps me from having to buy another um, switch. I'll usually inform the customer because if the other side ever goes out, then you will have to replace it. These switches usually range anywhere from 20 to 40 bucks, depending on what model of receiver and where you can find one and whether there's any on eBay at that point in time or whatnot. Anyway, give me just a second. I'm going to drop this switch to the other side and we'll see if it works or not. All right, we've got it hooked back up. Still um, on the continuity check. This OL stands for open link. means there is no connection between the two. I'm going to push the button here. And, ooh, I heard it start. Oh, but it's not great. Let me try cleaning the switch. It could just be uh, dirty in there. If cleaning it doesn't get it where it cuts on and off 100% every single time, uh, we'll order a new switch. Well, we're going to give it a shot here. Hang on one second. Well, we proceeded to do the cleaning that I was mentioning. I uh, tried a little bit of Deoxit D5 in there. And guess what? Um, still didn't help. It helped some, but not a lot. And so I actually took it apart. If you notice these little tabs here, these were bent over. Um, and that's what hell they were actually, if you'll notice here. This sat down in here and these tabs were bent over on all four sides and held the switch together. So sometimes when I've, I'm working on a switch that you just can't find a replacement for, um, sometimes you have to go inside of these things and dissect them and try to repair them on the insides. But um, I thought I'd take it apart and show you a couple things. One, if you notice down on the inside of this, and it's kind of hard to see here without getting it in light, there's some uh, copper posts down on the inside, and that, that connects to these two middle posts. Um, and then down on the other, on the inside there, you can see there's some more brass things that connects to these others, and they are just all gummed up really bad. But what what made me realize I needed a new switch was these little rockers that kind of go in the middle and toggle back and forth as you push the switch. Kind of hard to see, and I'm going to try to get it down on here and lit up a little bit, but at any rate, these ends are just burnt up. They're, uh, they're just about gone, and there's not much left to them. Otherwise, I would try, you know, using a file or burnishing tool or something and uh, cleaning them up a little bit. It's just not going to happen with this switch. Um, this thing's going to go into the garbage. Um, I will have to pull this end off. I cannot forget that. <laughs> Otherwise, when the new switch comes, you won't have the end to put back on it. But anyway, we're going to do that. I'm going to unsolder this ugliness wire. I don't know why they did this other than they needed an extension because they couldn't get it up in there. But these two wires here will reach. So don't even need to do that. I'll take this out of the this piece here, the jumper out of the way, and we'll get this thing going. But before I do that, I'm going to drop the camera one more time and show you one more thing uh, that should make you very happy. And we're back. Let's, uh, if you notice here on the other side of my bench, I keep a uh, whole pile of uh, jumper wires just hanging there. By the way, this is a handy little device, a uh, tube pin straightener. I've got one in here, and I've also got one in there on the other workbench where I do most of my testing. Anyway, what have I done here? I have taken these two wires that would go to that switch. Um, by the way, I cut off that junk that was uh, laying, that was uh, soldered onto them. And I have nothing more than a single jumper going down here to them. So what that is basically doing, this is the power switch. 
uh, but it is always on because it has uh, constant connection. So what I'm going to do is use my handy foot switch down here that you've seen many times now. I'm going to flip that on and guess what we have here. We got some burnout lights on the faceplate. I can see not all of them are firing. One down on this end and one way down on this end. But hey, that just gives us a chance to show you how to replace the uh, the fuse style light switches. But at any rate, what it does tell us is that this uh, Marantz works, and that, oh, we've got lights out down here as well in the meter switch. But um, yeah, the um, switch needs replacing is all it is, and we'll have this thing functional. I'm sure I'll do more to the uh, to the unit as I uh, get into it, but um, you know, I always, when I service one of these, I'll always uh, clean the uh, string path and guide and uh, lubricate all of that. I will always uh, check the bias on one of these. I'll always check the voltage coming out of the power supply to make sure it's where it should be and set the bias properly. Um, I'll let you a trick down here. There's some little square transistors here that get used a lot in the uh, pre and phono sections of these Marantz. And it's a very specific model number, but they are noisy. Um, and Fairchild Semiconductor makes a replacement. And so anytime I see those, if it happens to be the specific model number, I always replace those. It gets rid of a lot of the noise, especially in the uh, phono amp section. At any rate, stay tuned. This is going to be part one. Not much more I can do until I order and get a new switch in for this thing. But we'll come back with part two where we put the switch back in, um, replace some lights, um, give this thing an overall good tune-up service, and uh, kind of get things going again for the customer here. Thanks everybody for watching and I uh, hope you've enjoyed this video. Alright guys, I decided to add one more part before I wrap this thing up. If you remember, this was the part of the switch that actually you push, and this is where this was mounted. Uh, so you push the button, slides in and out. But if you'll notice on the end of this thing, it is actually um, a little flat blade, okay, which goes into a little flat slot inside the switch. Well, when you go to buy a replacement Marantz switch, you got two choices. You either find one that someone has gutted out of a uh, out of a you know a dead unit or whatnot, so an original one. And you'll pay uh, anywhere 25 to 40 bucks for one of those typically. Or there are some out there on eBay um, where people are basically selling uh, a modern version uh, switch that fits perfectly. So a couple things you got to consider if you go that new route. Um, first off, um, the holes right here to here. You need to measure that. So you just use a little micrometer. These are about... 20 um, centimeters, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, 22 millimeters long. Uh, so two centimeters and two millimeters from point to point. Um, the other thing you got to, for this one it was, the other thing you got to consider is that, uh, that, that little slot. Most of the new ones will have a square plug instead of this little round slug. So what you end up having to buy is a new switch that has a square piece on the end here versus this flat. And you have to go on eBay or somewhere and you have to buy a new um, little knob that pushes onto it for about uh, nine or 10 bucks that has a square opening in it instead of this uh, slotted. So just wanted you to be aware of that when you go to replace a switch on a ranch unit which by the way I have done dozens of switches on my ranch units so these original switches must not have been all that. <laughs> I have uh, replaced more than um, than I ever would have wanted to. So um, you're going to have to buy a new replacement switch. Switch does not have to look the same, by the way. It physically needs to be about the same shape, so it'll fit up here into this little slot. It has to have uh, the same kind of mount, face flush mount here with the screws. Screws have to align so that they will go into these two slots right here. And then, uh, like I said, you got to make sure you get a knob that matches. So not that big a deal, but I uh, just wanted you to be aware. I'm going to get online and order what it takes to replace this one. And uh, when it all shows up, we'll make video two in these series. Thanks again for watching.